Hey everybody, Leah Klett here with The Christian Post, and I'm so honored today to be joined by Carlos Whitaker. We're discussing his brand new devotional, Get Your Hopes Up, 90 Devotions and True Stories for Young World Changers. You are a busy man. I appreciate <clears throat> some time to speak with me. Absolutely. Listen, I'm, uh, I'm honored that you would let me. Well, we're talking about a really important book today, a very important subject. Yes. Um, get your hopes up and you have three, That's right. I followed you a little bit on social media over the years and you yeah. say that kids are being exposed to hate division, injustice, negativity, like never before. That's really concerning. It's, it's a scary time to be a parent, especially with the rise of social media. So yeah. let's just jump right in. I want to hear from you how you think this exposure to social media is affecting young minds and how this yeah. to really sort of inspired you to write this book. Yeah. You know, I, um, I make my living on social media. So, so I'm coming from this in two respects, right? Like I'm a, I'm a, um, I guess you would say quote unquote influencer that, you know, has a lot of eyes watching and listening to what I have to say on a daily basis while also understanding the perils of not only for children, but for adults, um, the uh, the way social media addiction and really the um, the places it can lead you um, really all have to be covered, I think, in some semblance of not only maturity, um, but grace and the gospel. And so when I look at kids, especially my kids, uh, the first thing I tell parents all the time is, is I, I'm the guy that makes his living on social media, but I'm also the guy that waited. I was the last of my friends to let their kids even have a phone, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like I, I'm, I'm always of the opinion that you can fast forward childhood, but you can never rewind it. And so I feel like what social media does is it fast forwards childhood, right? Like it, it's like an accelerator in childhood to, to pushing kids to being able to see things that maybe they, uh, they shouldn't see. Um, things that, again, even us as parents probably shouldn't see. Now, I say all that with the caveat that I've seen a lot of great things done uh, on my social media. We've raised over almost $2 million for strangers uh, through Venmo donations. These are people that follow me on a daily basis. So I see the good. I see the bad. And what I what I hope to let parents understand, especially, you know, with, with this devotional that I've given, is that... Um, Phones and technology and social media, th those actually aren't the problem. The, the, the problem is a, is a deeper seated root where hope begins. I mean, those are just things that can begin to destroy hope. But I believe that, you know, the hope that can be instilled in your child literally starts in the home. It starts with the parent um, not staring at their phone all the time, right? Like, like if, if your kid asks you to do something and you're like, oh, hold on one second. And you you look back down at your phone. That is literally the opposite of giving your kid hope. You're the one thing they can hope in, right? Like if if you've got a kid, um, I'm telling you, they can hope in sports. They can hope in celebrity. They can hope in all these things. They can hope in Jesus, but you are the visible example of Jesus in their life. And so you need to be the one that is instilling that hope in them. And so, yeah, so, you know, I try to tell people that the phone and social media they're just things, right? They're neither good nor they're bad. It's just a thing. It's a piece of glass of six inches of LCD that, you know, I could drop on the floor. It can break. It's This isn't good or evil. It's what we do with it. And so in writing this book, I give a couple examples to the kids on great things that um, have been very hope-filled that have happened even on my social media. But I also want the kids to realize where their true hope actually comes from. Um, and, and again, like you said, we live in a pretty, um, in a society that is filled with despair, pessimism. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I, you know, I'll be, I'll be honest. I'm, I'm preaching to parents a lot. Like we, our kids are watching us. Like our kids are listening to us. Our kids are listening to the conversations we're having are the conversations that we are having filled with hope or are they filled with despair? Oh, we're more divided than we've ever been. Oh, I can't, I'm so scared about the next election. Oh, well, a lot of what our kids are are gleaning from their hope is in us and in what we're saying. So, you know, it's a it's a stark reminder for parents to make sure that your conversations are just as hope-filled uh, or more hope-filled than they are pessimistic, especially because our kids 
are listening. That's so good. I mean, when it comes to social media, my husband and I talk about this a lot, how we're sort of the guinea pigs. We don't really have like a blueprint for how to <clears throat> handle technology, how to deal with it ourselves. And so I even find that my parents are more addicted to their phones than, than I am. Yes. Right? Yes. That is the truth. So how, what are some practical ways we as parents can have a, have a healthy relationship with our phones, with our social yeah. media? It's so good. I love that you said that, you know, your parents are more addicted uh, than you are. I find my mom too. I'm like, mom, can you get off the iPad? I need you off the of Facebook. Like, like, like let, let's, let's gaze up and glance down. That That's one thing that I tell people all the time is like gaze up and glance down. Like if we're just gazing down and only glancing up, we're literally going to speed past life. So let, let me dive into a little bit of, um, of your question, because it's actually, um, I've got an adult book coming out in the fall that speaks to everything you're asking me. So just so you know, um, it is a, it's a, it's an adult trade book that I'm talking about phones and our souls and how as adults, we need to redefine our relationship with them. So little tease for, for you and maybe your audience, but um, you know, one thing that, that I've, that we have a family have done is I did a little bit of research for my next book and, and realized and found out there was a Harvard study that was done in 2018 that shows that let me, I want to get this right. The 30 minutes before we go to bed, and the 30 minutes that we wake up in the morning, since we use our phones as our alarm clocks, what people end up doing, it's right next to our bed. We scroll for 30 minutes. We consume, consume, consume. Then when we wake up in the morning to our alarm clocks, which is our phones, there's notifications waiting for us. And as our eyes slowly unblur, we're reading emails and we're answering texts and we're looking at ESPN and all the things. And this study showed, this is mind blowing, that in the first 30 minutes we're awake, and the first or in the last 30 minutes before we fall asleep, that the average American consumes more content than my great grandparents generation consumed in a month, wow. in a month. And so I, I just think to myself, we were not created for that. Like, like there's no way that we were created for that much consuming of information. And so one of the simple things that I tell parents is l charge your phones in the kitchen. Like, like literally don't. Don't do it next to the bed. Go to Target and buy this really cool thing that you may not have heard about since the 90s. It's called an alarm clock. And you can plug it next to your bed. And all it does is wake you up in the morning. You don't well, you don't wake up and kind of start rubbing its face and touching it. No, it just it serves one purpose. Um, and it wakes you up. And then the first hour of my day, I don't look at my phone. I when I drink my coffee in the morning, I don't drink my coffee and read my emails. I just drink my coffee. And can I tell you? When you just drink your coffee without reading emails, your coffee tastes so much better. Other things that I've done uh, to help with social media as an adult is um, I, del I love the news. I think it's very important that we are staying up to date with current cultural issues and cultural context. I talk about a lot of these things on my social media. But do you know what I decided to do? I deleted all of the news apps off my phone and I deleted all of like Twitter, all of those things off my phone. And I started to get my news from this really cool thing that somebody throws in my front yard every single morning before I, before I wake up. It's called a newspaper. So th that's how I, I literally consume my news every day is I walk outside and I, with my coffee sometimes, I, I read the news and it's like, oh my gosh, this is great. I'm getting all the information I need. And when I'm done, if something happens on planet earth that is worth me knowing about, I will find out tomorrow morning. We don't need to be plugged in constantly. This constant barrage of information, I just kn I, I know now, and I think most people know because we all feel a problem with our phones. We weren't created for, we feel like life is speeding by us. We feel like the world is more divided than it's ever been. But here's the truth. The world's not more divided than it's ever been. Just take a look through any history book in your public library. You'll see the world's always been divided. The difference is we just now have access to more people's opinions than we've ever had before. So that I think is as adults, how we need to start thinking about how do we handle the access to opinions and content that we've never had access to before. So those are two simple things, you know, that I do. I bought an alarm clock. And so my phone is no longer next to my bed. Uh, and and I, I subscribe to a newspaper and that keeps me, you know, kind of, kind of plugged in. And so there's, there's a lot of other things we can do, but I think those are a, a good jumping off point. 
Well, I love that you're saying, you know, the problem is not a phone. It's our right. the problem is our discernment and our boundaries. Phones aren't going anywhere. Yes. Technology is nope. the future. AI is the future. We need to have discernment in how we handle it. Yes. Yes. I mean, the, the discernment piece, you know, I think is really important. And here's another thing, especially for our kids. You know, we, we may we may think that our kids um are are the ones that are like, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta be careful. They're gonna become addicted. They're gonna be, but actually when when like when I look at my, say my 19-year-old daughter, like she actually has a lot less of a problem with social media than I do. Right. Mm -hmm. So so like here, here I am, her dad. She's not sharing her life to the world constantly. She's not, it's just not something. And I feel like there's a generation rising up that sees the addiction of their parents that maybe are going to be the ones that teach us how it is to have these boundaries. Again, she, she loves technology. She's, you know, loves doing her outfits of the day or whatever it is that she does on her, uh, on her socials. But she, you know, we, we share each other's screen time. So I get to see my kids screen time. They get to see my screen time. There's some accountability for you. How about yeah. your kids seeing what you do on your phone as opposed to you just seeing what they do on their phone. And that really serves me a lot. So, you know, when my screen time, if I'm on a trip, Literally, my daughter, Sianna, will be like, hey, dad, I know that you're on a trip and you're not traveling with anybody, but I saw that you were on your phone for six and a half hours yesterday. Um, do you think that's healthy? <laughs> I start <laughs> laughing. I'm like, how is my 19-year-old fashion influencer getting on me? I was like, you're right. You're right. You know, so, yeah, I think that's helpful as well. But discernment, discernment, discernment. Yes, absolutely. I love that. I love that you're giving us hope for the next generation because yes. I just feel like there's a tendency of parents to just be like, we're, we're scared. We don't know what to do. And you're saying, no, there's hope. Get your hopes up. Get your hopes up, you know, get get it up. And, and you know what? Get your kids this book so that they, they can read it, get the hope, and then maybe they can give it to you. Maybe they can share, start sharing some stories with you to be like, you know what? Everything is actually going to be okay as long as we're purposeful with technology as long as we're purposeful with screens Can you share some of the examples that you you share in the book about how to address the modern challenges faced by faced by kids and parents and also you know some of some of the reasons we can have hope some of the ways that social media has been good for us yeah you know i i share a lot you know in in the book i i share stories of i call my instagram followers the insta familia um, and and I share a lot of examples on how the Insta Familia has come together uh, to give hope to people through our screens, through the phone. You know, one story that I share in there is about um, uh, the, a friend of mine that I met in the Atlanta airport. He's a piano player that was just playing, um, playing piano by the Chick-fil-A uh, next to Terminal A in the Atlanta airport. And I was walking by and I noticed that nobody was listening to him play the piano. And I noticed that. Um, he was playing to his heart's content and everyone was staring at their phones. And so I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go see him and I want him to see me, see him. So like, uh, you know, for kids to, to realize that you don't have to have a phone to see somebody. You can literally see somebody that's being ignored and you can go just say, hey, how's it going? What's your name? Can you tell me your story? And so that's what I did. That was kind of step one. I asked him his name. You know, he, he asked me my name. I told him how incredible his piano playing was. Uh, and then I used the phone for good. So then after I got to know him, I shared his story on my social media and we ended up, uh, I said, let's get, let's see what, how big of a tip we can give Tony in 30 minutes. Uh, and so I put my Venmo out there and sure enough, in 30 minutes, we had a $10,000 tip for Tony. And so I was able to give Tony a $10,000 tip. And by the end of 24 hours, he had $74,000 in his checking account because we decided to give him hope. How do we give him hope? We gave him hope, not just by money, but by seeing him. He felt seen. And so I, I tell kids a lot in the book, what are ways that you can see people that nobody else is seeing? That's just one of the examples that I give uh, that I think gives a good example on ways we can see people without our phones, but then how sometimes our phones can be um, agents for good and technology for good. So have your kids read this book? And if so, what is their response better? Or did they help you write this book? My, my son, uh, so my son is 16. And so he, he's maybe on a little bit more on the higher end of who would possibly read this book, but he loved it. He like devoured it. He was kind of like my 
beta test kid. I was like, Lasai, what do you think about this? So he actually, um, you know, maybe I should give edit him editing credit in the book because he actually was like, well, dad, I think if you came about it this direction, what if, what if I heard about this in one of my school lessons? And so he actually gave me some of the ideas for some of the people that are hope agents that I talk about in the book as well. So, you know, the book isn't just a book about stories of me and things that I've done. I'm, I'm probably only like 10 to 20% of the stories are about me. I went out and found other stories of hope uh, that I think kids will be able to attach to. And so, yeah, my son's read it. Um, he really enjoyed it. And my nephew, um, I just gave him a copy of the book and I'm pretty excited. He's 10 years old. So he's like prime demographic for this. I'm, I'm pretty excited to see uh, how he uh, takes to it. And also, you know, like it's, you know, we we hired an incredible illustrator. And so there's a bunch of great, you know, uh, pictures and characters in here. Uh, yeah, I just think it's it's going to be really fun. Well, you mentioned other stories. Talk about some of the role models you bring up in this book. Some of the, you know, civil rights leaders, biblical figures that young people can yeah. look to. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. You know, um, well, first and foremost, I talk a lot about my dad. So I've got a couple stories about my dad. So he's, you know, my, my dad uh, came from Panama as a black man in 1960 and immigrated to the United States. Uh, with $20 cash and a shoe shine kit. And I tell people that he ended up in the United States in a season when there wasn't a lot of hope for people that looked like him. Uh, and he actually became so, um, you know, uh, you know, he, he, he came here when um, he had nothing. And because he had hope in Jesus, he was at, you know, he didn't have hope in a system. He had hope in Jesus. And because his hope was in Jesus, he was able to overcome a lot of prejudice uh, that he landed inside of in America that he wasn't experiencing in Panama when he immigrated here. So I talk about my dad. I talk about Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and, you know, I talk about just how he was giving hope to a lot of people that were in my dad's season, in my dad's, you know, position. Um, I talk about these kids that were in um, Plumas County, California who they're, um, they were uh, 4-H kids and they were kind of selling livestock and like at the 4-H fair. And and I think this happened in 2021, their entire town burned down and like the, they had to rescue their animals from um, their barns as they're watching their barns burn down. But then they went with their animals, they still went to the 4-H fair and they sold their livestock to help rebuild their town. And they, these are high schoolers, these are middle schoolers. And so, to see that kids have such um, just strength inside of them. I want these, you know, I want the kids that are reading this to see stories of other kids uh, yeah. that are doing this stuff as well, not just adults. Uh, but th so there, I've got a lot of stories about kids as well. I got a story about uh, my daughter when she was 17 and she was in the hospital for an entire month uh, with this horrible lung disease and just the strength and the hope that she gave me. I was her parent. I was the one that was supposed to be hopefully giving her hope. But no, she's the one that gave me hope. And so even if if kids are going through sickness, if they're going through, you know, disease in their families, um, that there is hope in prayer, that there is hope in uh, praying for healing, even if healing doesn't look the way that we think it's going to look like, as it didn't for my daughter. Um, you know, there's just a lot of stories of kids their age that are hope agents as well. I love that. Well, Carlos, thank you so much for encouraging the next generation and just imparting practical biblical advice. I think it's so needed and it's needed for our generation. So I'm excited about your new book as well. What I did was I went and got my brain scanned by Dr. Daniel Amen um, the day before I went on this experiment. And so I went and got my brain scanned because I was on my phone seven hours a day and I wanted to see what my brain was doing. Then I spent two months and I never looked at a single screen. So I spent, I, I got rid of my phone, my iPad, my laptop, TV, everything. And I moved to an Amish town in Mount Hope, Ohio and lived with the Amish for a few weeks. And then I moved to a monastery and lived with a bunch of monks for a few weeks. And then I lived it with my family without technology. Then I went and got my brain rescanned at the end. And so the book is really helping us find those things that we've forgotten how to do as humans. Things like wondering, things like getting lost, things that we don't do anymore that I think God created us to do. Uh, and that's coming out in September. So I'd love to come back and talk about it.